that is sitting here this morning, I pray that you would shake their very hearts, that you would stir them, that you would convict them, and that you would help them to announce their ways, Lord, and turn unto you and call upon the name of the Lord. May your light shine through the darkness, and that veil be removed. I commit all these things into thy care. Amen. I just want to say this morning, if it's not immediately clear, Hell is real. I repeat, hell is real. If you just look at the very basic mechanics of our life uh, and, and the mechanics of this world, there's this underlying concept of you reap what you sow. If you wake up in the morning and you decide to do nothing, well, then you may perhaps lose your job. If you wake up in the morning and you decide to do nothing, perhaps you will never find your job. Perhaps. If you're writing an exam and you don't study, well, you're likely to fail. If you commit a crime in a good and just world, you would be arrested and taken to prison. If you murder someone, you will be sentenced to life imprisonment. These are the basic fundamental concepts of you reap what you sow, that the mechanics that God has designed and put in place. Why should eternity be any different if this is our reality? But perhaps if the logical argument doesn't land and doesn't suffice for you this morning, perhaps the accuracy and reliability of Scripture will do. There are 54 verses in Scripture that reference hell. And here's some of them. Deuteronomy 32.22 says, For a fire is kindled in my anger, and shall burn unto the lowest hell, and shall consume the earth with an increase, and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. Isaiah 5.14 says, Therefore hell hath enlarged herself, and opened her mouth without measure, and their glory, and their multitude, and their pomp, and, and he that rejoiceth shall descend into it. Luke 12.5 says, but I will forewarn you, whom shall ye fear? Fear him, which after he hath killed, hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. Second Peter 2 Peter 2.4 says, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down into hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness, to be reserved unto you. Hell is real. Hell is a place of torment, of eternal torment, a place of darkness, a place suitable enough for the bounds of the very darkest evil, a place filled with those who have murdered, killed, raped, abused, cheated, lied, and have thought evil thoughts. Jesus says in the book of Mark, and he said that which cometh out of man that defileth the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornication, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, and evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evils come from within and defile the man. Romans 21 8 says, But the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable, and the murderers, and the whoremongers, and the sorcerers, and the adulterers, and all liars, shall have their part in the lake of fire, which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Note, Scripture says, all liars, not some, all liars will have their part in the lake of fire. If you have ever lied before, then you stand before God condemned. How clean are your thoughts? As sure as the sun will rise tomorrow, as sure as you will breathe your next breath, as sure as the Lord Jesus Christ will return, we have all fallen short of God's glory. Do you see it, friend? Do you see that we fall short of God's standard? You think the challenges of your life today are hard. You think that the torment of your worst moment upon this earth is hard. We have not even considered what will come 
in that great eternal judgment on that fiery day. In fact, hell will be cast into the lake of fire. There will be no respite. There will be no joy. There will be no laughter. There will be no happiness. There will be no moment where you will get but a touch of water. There will be no breaks. Only destruction and continual evil. Not for one lifetime, not for two, but for all eternity to come. All you will know is pain. All you will know is suffering. You have broken God's law. And you stand before a holy God, guilty, condemned, and on your way to hell. If God was so creative in applying his mind to create this beautiful and wonderful earth, can you imagine what this God has done in thinking and conceiving of a place where the unjust, the abominable, those that have beaten, abused children, that have lied and have tortured, will go? Can you imagine how he's applied his mind there? Oh, we should fear, brothers and sisters. We should fear, friends. Revelation 6, 8 says, And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was death, and hell followed with him. Hell accompanies death. They ride together. If you had to die today, where would you go? Are you sure of will you, where you will be if you are judged by the Lord Jesus Christ? If you have broken just one of God's laws, you have failed to meet His standard. Being in church every day, uh, being in church every Sunday, does not qualify and does not wipe away your sin. Popes, men, good deeds cannot atone for your sins. Your father, your mother cannot help you wipe away your sins. No ordinary man, no ordinary woman can stand as your substitute. Where are you going when you die? Turn your Bibles with me to John. And we're going to be looking at John 1, 29. John 1, 29. And the Bible says, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, that which taketh away the sin of the world. This is absolutely amazing. Right at this beginning of the portion of the New Testament, we see John the Baptist seeing Jesus and saying, Behold. Behold means gaze. Gaze intently. Look. See. Something different. Someone different. Behold. It's Jesus. And then he goes on to say, Which taketh away the sins of the world. There's an action. Jesus. He's prophesying Jesus is going to do something. Jesus. Here's this man. Pay attention. He's going to come. And take away the sin of the world. But far more than that, there's something here that John the Baptist does, and this is why I believe that Jesus Christ says himself in, uh, I think it's um, um, Mark 11, 11, and Matthew 11, 11, where he says that John the Baptist is the greatest living prophet, or the greatest prophet of a woman. And why so is because here he does not only, only say what Jesus will do, but it explains how God will take away sin. And it's in those simple words, the Lamb of God. Jesus Christ was going to be that Lamb. He was going to be that sacrifice. He would be the way for which our sins, your sins, my sins would be atoned for once and for all. The Creator dying for His creation. The Son dying for the, the atonement of sin. Does this not reflect the holiness of God? No man could stand up and atone for all our sin. No man could stand up and atone for your sin. No man can, could stand up and atone for sins to come. 
No, it, ha it, it had to be something far more. The payment, the holiness of God required a most high payment, and that was his son. Does this not reveal the extreme cost of our sins? God needed a payment for your sin and mine that would cost him. His son would need to be beaten. His son would need to be pierced. His son would need to be pulled up on a cross and mocked, beaten, and laughed at and scoffed. The great and mighty God, descending manifest in the flesh, persecuted on our behalf for our sin. The holiness of God stands just. I've run into many JWs um, in my life, as I'm sure you have. They come knocking on your door. You see them clearly in Dalvinville. I've had many great conversations with them through the years. I also, in growing up in um, Indian schools, um, have had many, many Muslims try and convert me. Um, and the common thing between the JWs and the Jehovah Witness, the Je Jehovah Witness and the Muslims, is that they both espoused Jesus Christ as a great prophet. So they would use that. They would say, well, yeah, Jesus, you know Jesus. Yes, Jesus is great. We have, we also have Jesus. But their Jesus is not our Jesus. Their Jesus is not the God of the Bible. The Jehovah Witnesses have their own Bible, the New World Translation. And the Muslims have their Quran. Mark 13.22 says, For false Christs, and false prophets shall rise and shall show signs and wonders to seduce, if it were possible, even the elect. Their Jesus is not our Jesus. Their Christ is not our Christ of the Bible. Their Jesus is merely a prophet and ours is God. But why does this matter? Simple. How can any of our sins, or all our sins, if you think of it uh, uh, from the time of Adam and Eve, all the sins, if you had to bring all of them, a man, as I mentioned before, can't atone for it. Nothing you can give God, nothing that you have can help you attain or even pay God for, for those things that you've done. Perhaps one or two men could do some great and mighty acts, Perhaps they could come close, but that's still insufficient. No, we need a significant payment. We need a payment that endures time. The payment has to be great, and that can only come from Christ himself. God himself becomes the payment. God himself becomes the atonement. Jesus must be God for the payment to be sufficient. Only an eternal payment can stand for an eternal judgment. Only an eternal payment can stand for eternal security. Only an eternal payment can redeem you from hell. The payment has to be Jesus Christ as God. The verses that are refutable to this fact that Jesus is God is quite clear in John. If you go to the start of John, it says, John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. There's the Word. It's right there with God, both existing. All things were made by Him, and without, without Him was not anything made that was made. Jesus, the Creator. If we're still unclear as to who the Word is, John continues on and he goes in verse uh, uh, 14, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Verse 15 says, John, the witness of Him. And you continue on here and you see John talk about Jesus Christ as we saw in verse 29. And then if we go on and we look at 1 John uh, 5, 7, John continues on there and he speaks about how uh, the Father, uh, the, uh, the Father, the Holy Spirit and the Word, they are one. The Holy Trinity. God, uh, Jesus Christ is God. 
The Muslims don't have it right. The Jehovah Witness don't have it right. Jesus as God matters. That is his identity. And that is the only way we can have eternal atonement for our sins. If we look at Romans 3.10, uh, if we look at Romans, um, you can turn your Bibles to Romans 3. I'm kind of going to kind of do that basic thing of going the Romans wrong. <clears throat> Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All of us. That's not just some. That's just not certain. That's all. Everyone has fallen short of God's glory. In fact, a verse, uh, just a few verses before this, it says in Romans 3.10, As it is written, there is none righteous. None. No, not one. We are all guilty before God. Do you see it, friend? Your good works can't help you. Your goodness, your attempt to be good, your attempts to make things right with God, your pleading for forgiveness is insufficient. It cannot do justice before a holy God. You are condemned. Romans 6.23 goes on to say, For the wages of sin is death. Your sin, as you continue to do them on each and every single day that you get up and live this life, is setting you on a path of destruction. Either your mind is becoming corrupted as you head towards the very parts of destruction, or it speaks to that second aspect. Maybe you've heard the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ before, and you reject, and you reject, and you reject. There's a day coming, brother or sister or friend, where the Lord Jesus Christ will end your days, where you will not have another opportunity now is your hour. Call upon the name of the Lord. Revelation 20.14 says, And the death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Romans 5.8 goes on to say, But God... God seeing that there's just no way, there's no way, there's nothing that we can do. We have nothing to offer God. And He looks down upon us and He sees the sinful generation and He looks down with love in His heart. Despite us continually breaking His rules, despite us continuing turning away and rejecting Him, He looks at us with love. But God commended His love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ did the act. He did the work that you could not do. He sent Jesus Christ on your behalf. He knew you couldn't do it, so he made the way. How amazing is our Lord? Do you see the opportunity that stands before you, friend? Do you see what Jesus has done for you? Jesus made the way. Romans 10, 9 goes on to say, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. You know, we are on the streets a lot, Tyron and I, and we hear a lot of people say, yeah, I believe, I believe, I believe in Jesus. It's not enough. It's not enough to believe in Jesus. The devil believes in Jesus. You see that uh, at the temptation of Christ, just after he was baptized, he goes into the desert. There's Satan pulling out scripture, quoting scripture to Jesus. Thou shalt not live by bread alone, but by the very words of God. There is Jesus Christ being tempted. There is Satan believing on God. But that's why these words here are said, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart. It's insufficient for it to be logical. It's insufficient for it to be just purely understanding. It has to touch in the heart. You have to see your sin. You have to see your ways and be convicted, brother, friend. You have to see you stand before a holy God. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. There's the next part that you need. 
Jesus Christ did not just die, but rose again. And raised from the dead, thou shalt be saved. That's the gospel right there. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Confess, believe in thine heart, and thou shalt be saved. Roman 8, 1 reminds us of the beauty that we lay hold to, the treasure that we lay hold to when we are saved. We, the Bible says in 8, 1, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. When you are saved, you stand before God sinless. Stand before God clean. Your debt cast away as Craig mentioned earlier. You take on that new name. You are now adopted. You are a child of God. Praise the Lord. I want to read to you this uh, um, little portion of uh, Spurgeon's sermon uh, it really spoke to me, um, and I, I, I pray it will bless you. There are some of you standing in these aisles and sitting in these pews, who I feel in my soul will never have another invitation. And if this will be rejected today, I feel a soul, solemn emotion <coughs> in my soul. But I think it is of the Holy Ghost that you will never hear another faithful sermon, but you shall go down to hell. Impenitent, unsaved, except you trust in Jesus now. I speak not as a man, but I speak as God's ambassador to your souls. And I command you in God's name, trust Jesus, trust now. At your peril, reject the voice that speaks from heaven. For he that believeth not shall be damned. How shall you escape if you neglect so great a salvation? When it comes right home to you, when it thrusts itself in your way, oh, if you will neglect it, how can you escape? With tears I will invite you, and if I could, I would compel you to come. Why will you not? Oh, souls, if you will be damned, if you will make up your mind, then no mercy shall ever woo you, and no warning shall ever move you. Then, sirs, what chains of vengeance must you feel that these slights, that slight these bonds of love? You have deserved the deepest hell, for you slight the joys of love. God save you, he will save you, if you trust in Jesus. God helps you to trust him even now, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Friend, I'm going to take a moment now and have a moment of, of silence. If you've been convicted today, I ask you to use that silence turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. Confess, believe in that heart and ask him to save you. Thereafter, that short silence, I will just turn and close the message in prayer. Let's close our eyes. Lord, we come before thee now, and I pray, dear Lord Jesus, that your word would have spoken, would have shone through, through the darkness and remove the veil. I thank you for those that are saved that know you. I thank you for your redemptive work. I thank you that you did everything. And Lord, all you ask simply is that we would believe. Thank you for the faith that you've provided us. Thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. And thank you for that perfect payment, that atonement for sin. Thank you, Lord, for all that you went through on our behalf. We will not conceive until that great and glorious day when we see you in heaven. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your care. Bless us as we depart. Bless now this time. Amen.